Good evening. I'm Janet Gornick, Professor of Political Science and Sociology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I'm also director of the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality, the co-host of this program. I welcome you to this evening's event. Tonight, we focus our attention on the broad question, is globalization over? Our panelists are going to address several intertwined issues, including among others, the overall state of globalization, looking beyond just the trading of goods, the apparent effects of both the Trump presidency and Brexit on the global trading system and on the politics of trade, the potential consequences of the COVID pandemic, including the emerging phenomenon of vaccine nationalism. And of course, lessons to be drawn from the fiasco that the whole world just witnessed in the Suez Canal. The panel will begin in just a few moments. Later in the program, the panelists will take questions from the audience and you'll learn more about that process a little bit later. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our four participants and I'm gonna do that briefly, mindful that I'm forgoing most of their accomplishments. Chad Bown is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. His research examines international trade laws and institutions, as well as trade disputes and negotiations. He previously served on the White House Council of Economic Advisors and as lead economist at the World Bank. He's author or editor of several books, including Self-Enforcing Trade, Developing Countries and WTO Dispute Settlement from 2009 and The Great Recession and Import Protection, The Role of Temporary Trade Barriers from 2011. Sumeya Keynes is trade and globalization editor for The Economist. And before joining The Economist, she carried out research on public finance and pensions at the Institute for Fiscal Studies in London. And prior to that, she worked in the banking and credit team at Her Majesty's Treasury. She also co-hosts a weekly podcast with Chad Bown called Trade Talks. And in addition to participating in tonight's discussion, Sumeya will also lead the conversation. Mark Levinson is an independent historian and economist. He spent many years as an economics journalist, becoming finance and economic editors of The Economist in London. Returning to New York, he spent a decade at J.P. Morgan Chase. And his books include The Box, How the Shipping Container Made the World Smaller and the World Economy Bigger from 2006, and Outside the Box, How Globalization Changed from Moving Stuff to Spreading Ideas, published in 2020. And before I move on to our last panelist, I cannot resist noting that Mark received his PhD in history from the CUNY Graduate Center. So Mark, welcome home. And last but not least, Paul Krugman is Distinguished Professor of Economics here at the CUNY Graduate Center, a core faculty member in the Stone Center and a New York Times columnist. And tonight's panel will touch on economic questions that he has spent decades thinking about, namely trade and economic geography, the work for which he was awarded the 2008 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. He is author of many books, most recently, Arguing with Zombies, Economics, Politics, and the Fight for a Better Future. So welcome, welcome to our audience and welcome to our panelists. And Sumeya, now I turn the event over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Janet. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you will enjoy this discussion, the title of which is, Is Globalization Over? And as someone who is currently trying to move my two pet cats from America to Britain, uh, I'd say that there is some sand in its wheels. Uh, COVID-19 has depressed international air travel, uh, which is a major artery for global trade and not just of my pets. Although at this precise point in time, that's my main concern. Um, today is not about my pets. Um, it is about other challenges to globalization. Uh, there have also been issues moving things by boat, which is something that I'm sure we will discuss uh, given uh, Mark's expertise. Um, so let's think about a year ago, uh, trade was plummeting. Uh, COVID was hitting, it was, it, it looked bad. But I, I don't think anyone thought that the drop would be permanent. Um, and in fact, looking at the data, trade has rebounded remarkably quickly, um, at least relative to after the global financial crisis. 
but it came at a time when when people were already warning that globalization was under strain uh, open trade complex supply chains the world moving closer to becoming a single market that all relies on trust relies on stability it relies on the idea that you will be able to get your parts from a to b and if you can't be so sure of that if you are a multinational company, and I think they account for something like two thirds of global goods trade, if you aren't so sure of that stability, maybe you want to fragment your production. Uh, maybe you aren't so comfortable picking that one place and using that as a hub to serve the whole world. Maybe you want to hedge. Um, and that led to these concerns that, um, you know, with all the rising tensions and risks that they were seeing, that maybe globalization would go into retreat. We would see um, a fragmentation, a reversal of this trend towards the world becoming closer and closer um, to this integrated single market. Um, again, looking at the data, uh, global goods trade fell by more than real global GDP last year. The trade fell by more than, than overall economic output in the world. But by 2022, it's projected to more than make up the difference. Uh, so that kind of very short term data looks quite good if you're thinking about the long term, the, the future of trade. Um, but if you look at the longer term trend, the broader context uh, is that essentially after growing very, very quickly relative to global GDP, uh, in future trade will not grow um, so quickly relative to GDP. Growth will not be be as trade intensive as it once was. And so all of that motivates this question, is globalization over? Now, uh, I now want to turn it um, to the others. Um, so and Mark, I, I was hoping to turn to you first. Um, and so my, my broad question that I'm going to ask to all three of you is, when people talk about this topic, when people talk about the end of globalization, or when people say, no, 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 globalization has never been healthier, everything's brilliant, what do they get wrong? What are they missing? Uh, and let's focus on trade and in goods and stuff. Where is the conventional wisdom wrong? Mark, what do you think? When people talk about globalization, they often have in mind a particular version of globalization. And that's what we've gotten to know really over the past 30 years. This globalization that's based on these extremely long uh, supply chains, or as I prefer to call them value chains, because they also involve trade and services that are embedded along with the goods. Uh, this has been globalization as we've known it in recent years, but it's quite possible to imagine other iterations of globalization. And in fact, we've seen them. Uh, we saw globalization, with globalization arguably began 1820s, 1830s, and it was heavily trade in primary products coming from poor countries, going to rich countries. There was almost no trade in manufactured goods. Yes, the world was quite globalized in a certain way, but not in a way that would be familiar to us today. We had globalization that many of us recall from the uh, 60s and the 70s based on multinational companies where a company had its headquarters in a rich country, whether the Netherlands or Japan or the United States, and it had factories out in some of the poor countries to serve those local markets. And so the rich country was the hub and a bunch of poor countries were often the spokes. Well, we're in a very different situation now with uh, supply chains going from country to country, manufactured goods in process, moving through these supply chains, these value chains. And most of this international trade in goods is actually stuff that's in the process of being made. It's not stuff that you can walk into the store and buy. What we've seen for the last dozen years or so is that trade in goods has been growing more slowly than the world economy. It's not going away. So in that sense, globalization is not dead, but it's no longer the driving force in the world economy as it was for several decades. This predated Brexit. This predated Donald Trump. This predated the trade war with China. So it's really based on uh, some much deeper economic factors, I think, some of which you just hit on. 
So I don't think globalization is dead by any stretch, but I think it's, it's heading into a, a different phase and we can come back to that. Great, I look forward to that. Um, Paul, what, what do you think? When you hear people talking about the end of, of globalization or, or that it, the, the fact that it's never been healthier, um, what's your, bog, your bugbear? What makes you wince that people just don't understand? Okay, it's two things. One is that uh, there is this tendency to believe that the natural, that, that a well-functioning world economy always has rising globalization, always has trade growing faster than GDP. The world is always getting flatter. And that that's, doesn't have to be true. Even if everything's going right, if, um, if the technology of transportation advances more slowly than the technology of producing things locally, then it can go the other way. And it's they, this period, the, 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 the kind of globalization that, that, um, that Mark is talking about is it's an exceptional thing. There are a couple of points in history when that happens. There's the, you know, the, the, the steam engine and all of that once upon a time, and then the, the box, the container more recently, um, but no reason to think that will keep happening. And, uh, and quite possible that we've learned a little bit that about the, the problems with that. I mean, the, as Sumea, what you were talking about, I mean, the, these uh, complex value chains do create inherently, even in the best uh, environment policy, uh, political environment, there, there's, uh, maybe maybe we all got, I think Mark's latest book is kind of about that also. People got too enthused about the about the saving a few pennies by producing in, in, in the lowest cost production site and didn't really think uh, sufficiently about the logistical issues. What I think people might be missing right now, actually one more thing about, well, two things think people are missing. I'm going to turn to a Monty Python routine if I don't uh, limit it there. Um, the um, one is that uh, the the short term trade numbers are always you should never judge things by one year, and you really shouldn't judge them now because it's all distorted by the pandemic. I mean, they, uh, I, I don't know that we can put a number to this, but a lot of there was a lot of substitution of goods for services. Uh, you uh, couldn't go to the gym, so you purchased a, an exercise machine, which was probably largely made in Asia. And so there was actually, there, after, after the initial shock, there was actually kind of a boost because by and large, you know, uh, uh, goods are still a lot more tradable than services. So you don't want to pay too much attention to that. What I think we may not be fully taking on board, and this actually comes back to, Sumaya, to your point, the risks involved in these chains are not just the uh, risks that, of lost ships or of, of the, the ship that has the, the parts you needed being spending two weeks waiting off the port of Los Angeles. Um, it's also longer term. Um, we've just been through a crazy period of erratic policy. Um, we've seen Brexit also, but in the US, we, we saw the Trump uh, era. Um, and that, even if not much of the concrete legacy of, of higher tariffs persists. The fact is that it happened, and we now know that it can happen. Um, and just to uh, finish off here, when, when you look back at, at the surge of exports from China, I remember when China joined the WTO and got uh, normal trading relations, and a lot of people, I'm, I, think, I think I probably am on record as saying something um, that turns out to be wrong, which is, well, it's not, you know, the tariffs are already pretty low. It's not going to matter that much. But what turned out was that the assurance the sense of security, the sense that you had guaranteed access to markets led to a lot of export oriented investment and therefore had big effects on trade. And we're now doing that in reverse. We've now learned that, uh, that the world's uh, leading economy, at least for the moment, um, can decide that imports of, of aluminum from Canada are, are a national security threat. And that even if we don't do it again in the next four years, the fact that people, that businesses know that can happen is going to, I think, exert a longer term dampening effect on, on trade. Thank you. Um, great. And last but not least, uh, Chad, what, what, are, what are your bugbears? Yes, I think I might just pick up a little bit on, on, on what was talking about there. I think trade in many respects is, is oftentimes built on trust, right? Um, and over time, uh, when you have a lot of integration, you know, if I'm a, think about the United States and China, right? We, you know, we've become reliant on China. We've given up many of the things that we used to produce uh, out of the expectation that we'll be able to import that. We'll you know, be able to import it, it's cheaper, whatever. 
Um, but it also means that we'll be able to import it in our times of need. Um, and what we've seen, I think, over the last couple of years, and this, some of the stuff predates the pandemic, is the increasing use of things like export restrictions um, by major economies. And so the first time this happened, I you know think back to China and the story about when they stopped shipping rare earth metals uh, to Japan in, I think it was 2010. Uh, and that kind of sent a shockwave to around the world to say, oh, China has market power. China can stop doing this stuff. Hmm, maybe we need to be more worried about China than we have been previously. Well, over the last couple of years, the United States has done similar things on things like semiconductors and equipment, refusing to sell them to uh, China, you know, a country that was in need of those things. During the pandemic, we've seen countries impose export restrictions on personal protective equipment when there were shortages, right? And, and that erodes trust in and of itself. And I think that the, the response to that is countries saying, woof, maybe I can't trust trading partners to actually imp, you know, to, to send me their exports in the times of need. Um, so maybe I need to produce more of that stuff here locally, reverse some of this globalization. We've seen some of that take place you know, over the last couple of years, whether it's China subsidizing semiconductors, whether it's in the United States, we're now subsidizing production of personal protective equipment. Um, and so I don't, you know, this, this certainly doesn't to say that there's going to be a reversal of globalization, but I think in some areas we're seeing governments do things and respond in ways that maybe we haven't seen previously. Yeah, and just to, just to build on that, I think um, one of the striking things for me was to spend a few years you know, going through the Trump administration and on all of this talk about tariffs, right? And and actually, when you spoke to some of the you know bigger businesses, um, the tariffs were a pain, um, but at at one point they were perceived to be a bit to be temporary. I think right now that's that's less the case, um, but the reality is that you can get past tariffs right? You can just pay them. Um, and so although it was, you know, the, these these trade barriers were generating changes in behavior, um, they perhaps weren't as big as certainly some in the Trump administration would have liked. And I think that Chad is right, is in that the, the pandemic did, there was a real step change there. Um, or the, you know, the, the change was the difference between the tariffs, which you can get past, and export restrictions, which is a, just a yes, no, right? And, and there it was much more common for me to speak to companies who were kind of saying, wait, what? We can't, we can't get our stuff out. Well, we can't put our factories there, right? That, that location is no longer a good one for future investments as an export hub because it's just not reliable. Um, and, you know, I've spoken to companies who are having to, to essentially diversify their production to get around those export restraints. And the, the response seems much more um, dramatic in the, in the short term. Now, that's very anecdotal. Uh, an economist has just, you know, died in, in my, you know, uh, like, a, like a fairy dies every, every time you say you don't believe in fairies. Um, that's just happened with an economist. Um, uh, so take, take that with a pinch of salt. And I hope in a few years time, uh, some economists will go and write the paper that, that confirms my, my anic data. Um, the, and, and I suppose I just want to offer my, my bugbears um, when I completely agree with Paul, right? The, the short-term trade data is incredibly misleading. It's distorted. It jumps over the place. You can't tell anything about long-run trends by looking at three years of data. Um, uh, and, and the reality is that if we're thinking about big changes, we're really thinking about changes in supply chains. Um, and those are just very slow to shift because they involve making massive, massive investments. Um, and so that would be my own personal bug, about which, which obviously I am now criticizing myself um, for what I did in my, my opening remarks. Um, so far, we've mainly spoken about uh, trade in goods. Um, and I guess, a question to, to the three of you might be, um, well, Alan Beattie at the Financial Times wrote this, this kind of piece a while back about why services don't get enough love, right? And, and they're kind of complicated. Um, the barriers are very uh, technical, that you can't put your hands on them. They're kind of, they're less, e they're more difficult to talk about. Um, and also they're quite badly measured. Um, and I, I guess the question for the three of you is whether you think that the story for services is very fundamentally different 
um, to the story for, for goods? Um, and should we, should we be giving more attention to trade and services um, in our general conversations about, about trade? Um, Mark, do you, do you have views? Sure. Uh, I think that the story of services is quite different than the story with respect to goods. A services trade as measured is uh, declining at this point as a share of GDP. Uh, you can't very easily get on an airplane and, and travel around the world as your cats have discovered. And so we're seeing that, that services are, are retrenching. In the long term though, uh, we're seeing that uh, people spend more money on services as they grow wealthier and less on, on goods. And as they grow older, Beyond that, there is an enormous growth in types of services that are not really measurable. And I think this is a real challenge for economists, okay? Uh, envision a, a company that has research centers on three continents, not unusual these days. They are trying to develop a piece of software, okay? They have people in France who work on this software, okay? And they have people in Kentucky who work on this software. And they have people in Korea who work on this software. And the work gets passed around the world while they're developing this product, okay? How much of it is an export or an import from any country? Nobody knows and nobody cares, okay? There is no transaction. And remember, trade data track transactions, right? When something is purchased or sold or physically moves across the border where we can value it. But when we're exchanging services in the way I've just described to you, there's no transaction, there's nothing measurable. We don't really know how much of it is going on. But all of the evidence is that there is an increasing amount of it as these sorts of uh, technical skills, engineering skills, uh, scientific skills, uh, can be traded very easily around the world within individual corporations without being counted anywhere. And I think that's really going to be of increasing importance in the coming years, uh, even if we can't uh, put numbers on it very well. Great. Paul? Yeah, any... so I want to, um, uh, two, I want two points there. And I think I, I do want to follow on this, but it, uh, one thing is that even where there is a transaction, um, the reported numbers may be a very, very poor guide. I mean, this is one of the things we're, we're, we're talking a lot now about uh, international tax avoidance. And one of the big things is intellectual property. Um, if some intellectual property is created by Apple, well, we think it was actually created by Apple's uh, staff in, in the United States, and it's then transferred to... Apple Ireland and then transfer to someplace else and the transfer prices probably have nothing whatsoever to do with the actual economic value of the transaction. They're all about making the profits pop up in low tax jurisdictions. And that, that's huge. I mean, we, we know that we, we talk about uh, trying to de uh the uh, national accounts because it's big enough, not just to distort the trade numbers, but actually to seriously distort our measurement of GDP and at least for smaller countries. Uh, so, that, so yeah, this is, it, now, now the question is whether that sort of thing makes trade and services look smaller or bigger than it really is. And the answer to that, to that is probably yes, uh, probably both, it just distorts it all over the place. Um, however, the one thing I would say about services is uh, I happen to have recently reread, there was a, a widely discussed paper by my former colleague, Alan Blinder, uh, about how enormous amounts of services were actually exposed to globalization. And we we're gonna see epical changes in, in, um, in, from the effect of, of trade, of service globalization. That paper was in 2006 and it still hasn't happened. And the sort of explosion of, certainly of visible economic dislocations from service trade has fallen way, way short of where people thought it was going to be uh, when they were looking forward from 15 years ago. And I'm not entirely sure why. I mean, it seems obvious, particularly at, at this point where you know, none of us are in, the, uh, are in the same place at the moment. Um, and you would think that there would be enormous, the technology would, would make it possible to do a lot more of that. And we don't see it. And I'm not entirely sure why. Most services that are, are actually pretty much localized 
but uh, but there certainly seem to be a lot of things that should be tradable services. But I don't think even even if the numbers are lousy, I don't think we're actually seeing anything like the explosion of service trade. Service globalization has not proceeded nearly as rapidly as people thought it was going to, and I don't know why. I'll just just I only have maybe two quick things on this. Um, I, mean, I think the pandemic is, is going to be a fascinating experiment for what happens. And I agree with everybody. The data is terrible and it's almost impossible to kind of read, you know, anything out of the data, especially in real time. Um, but I think what, what the pandemic has forced everybody to do is, is to be creative. And so we may now see, you know, services that we thought weren't tradable uh, in the past, all of a sudden becoming so, right? I think the the telemedicine that we've seen develop, maybe now all of a sudden more of that kind of stuff crosses borders. Um, you know, I've heard this talking to some semiconductor companies the other day and with the pandemic and their inability of them to be able to move their engineers all over the world, um, they were talking about how they got around that, you know, to establish new product lines by just figuring out that all they had to do was attach a GoPro camera to somebody local to be able to walk around and you know instruct a local engineer to do the, the particularly particular things that needed to get done. So I, this is just to say that there are creative ways that I think they've been forced to confront and that may lead to changes both in services trade, but perhaps also in a complementary sense in, in goods trade um, in the future now that we've kind of gone through this very, very odd uh, experience. Great. Okay, I'm going to um, zigzag uh, around here and take my um, privilege as leader of this conversation uh, to go to something much more tangible, which is uh, the boat. Um, so the world was. See, Chad's very excited. Um, so the world was watching uh, when when the boat got stuck. Um, uh, you know, we've all we've all celebrated that the boat is now unstuck. Um, but, but thinking of, of kind of broader lessons, right? So maybe maybe we'll have learned that services are more, more tradable than, than we thought. Um, what lesson did we learn from the boat? Uh, and, and Mark, this one is for you. I think we learned what a lot of people who were involved with uh, international trade already knew, which is that these long value chains can be more fragile than people anticipated. Uh, there are a whole lot of folks who have their goods still stuck on that ship today. Uh, the, the ship has been freed now for a couple of weeks, but uh, their goods are still sitting in containers and they'll get delivered maybe when they get delivered. Uh, I think that there has been, a, in the business sector, uh, a lot of, of understanding for a number of years that there's a need for more attention to resilience, to redundancy, to not putting all your eggs in one basket. And the boat, I think, uh, confirmed that for, for many businesses. Um, th there is a basic um, conflict here, and it's worth pointing out. And, and um, so let me do that for just a minute. Uh, to a certain extent, resiliency in, say, a supply chain is like uh, buying an insurance policy. It's going to cost you more. It's probably cheaper if you're in a mass production business. It's probably cheaper to make everything in one big factory in a single place. And it's probably cheaper to sign a contract with one ship line to carry all of those goods because by giving it all your freight, you've got the, you're going to negotiate the best rate. Okay. And so you have incentives to do that. Uh, if you are concerned about resiliency, you split your production into two different factories, you strike deals with two different ship lines and you set up distribution centers at various locations, you've probably raised your costs of producing each item that you make. So in the short term, you're actually at a competitive disadvantage by being more careful about your risk, by creating a resilient supply chain. If there's no interruption, you lose and the person who bet everything on a single factory wins. So there's an incentive for businesses not to go overboard in terms of managing their risks in this way. And I think it's going to be an ongoing problem in, in terms of globalization that uh, the desire to gain profits in the short term 
uh, to uh, have a short-term competitive advantage really creates reasons not to uh, mitigate your risks and, and to uh, manage your affairs for the long term. One of the yeah. most fascinating um, things I found uh, in, in, well, Mark's written two books, um, both of which I would highly recommend. Um, and one of the really interesting points, um, Mark, that you make uh, uh, is that essentially um, the some of the growth in international trade could be the result of a distortion um, in that actually a lot of travel by boat, travel by sea um, has been subsidized uh, in the way that travel by truck um, perhaps has not, right? And so that has kind of inflated the amount of international uh, commerce um, because this, this method of, of transport has been made artificially cheap. Uh, I mean, again, sorry, I'll stick on you just because boats are right. so fascinating. Um, is that is that kind of still very, very much the case today? Um, is that kind of an important first order uh, driver of, of global trade, do you think? Uh, whether it's a first order driver, um, I have not tried to estimate it, but there are huge subsidies that have uh, really stimulated globalization, in my opinion, to excess. One of them is subsidies for uh, shipbuilding and ship ownership, which means that shippers, those are the people who own the cargo, like the retailers and, and the manufacturers, they don't actually pay the full cost of, of transporting their goods. And there are all sorts of other subsidies that are embedded in these value chains, whether it's the ability to uh, emit greenhouse gases or, or to uh, have a polluting water coming out of your factory, uh, whether it's uh, the sorts of uh, tax breaks that Paul was referring to earlier, which uh, multinational corporations can take advantage of fairly easily in many cases, whereas small local companies really have a lot of trouble taking advantage of, uh, whether uh, it's flat out subsidies to establish a manufacturing plant in a different location. And, and now we've seen uh, countries and localities paying billions of dollars to uh, persuade a company to actually set up shop here. Uh, once you take all those things into account, it gets pretty hard to argue that the pattern of trade is based on a comparative advantage, like we all learned it is back in school. Uh, this, the shape of trade, the pattern of trade is very much affected by these subsidies. And I would argue that not that trade is bad by any means, but that these subsidies helped drive it to excessive levels. That's actually I'd, kind of raised. I'd it. love for Paul and, and uh, Chad to take me on there. Actually, Paul, no, I, I'm yeah. not going to disagree. I just wanted to weigh in and say uh, it raises an interesting question because the the the, the obviously the um, the Suez blockage was photogenic. And made lots of you know, but um, but there there are major other things. I mean, the the uh, we have a global container shortage. I think in large part because the port facilities are are, are inadequate to, uh, to so we have lots of ships um, you know, just just cruising back and forth and off the coast of California waiting for a slot. Um, and the natural response is, well, we we need to build more infrastructure. We should be investing in expanding those those container ports, uh, but maybe not. Maybe we should just be charging more. Maybe that we've actually got too much trade going on, and, and we shouldn't be uh, enabling it. I mean, it's a little bit like like the way when we talk about traffic. You know, uh, we know that motor vehicle traffic has lots of negative externalities, and that building more highways to accommodate it is not necessarily. Good. Maybe there's something similar going on here. And a thousand shippers just shook their fists uh, in, yes. in anger. <laughs> um, Chad, what actually, would you by the way, I, I, I just I, sorry, just quick. I, I don't have something quite up there with your cats, but the uh, uh, I'm actually a personal example of the uh, of the shift to goods and also of the the logistical issues because I, I in fact did since the, the gyms are closed. I in fact did order a, a stationary bike made in China, and it. So there we go, shifting from domestic services to imported goods. However, it failed to arrive and the shipper finally just apologized. And then I read, I, they'd never gave an explanation, but the, um, the, I read a story that said with all of these container ships steaming back and forth, there's a, a huge increase in the number of containers that are being washed overboard in storms. So maybe that's what happened. Anyway, sorry. 
Oh dear. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, the the yeah, only thing that I was going to jump in with is just to say as a panelist, it is like an, an absolute dream come true to be on with the three of you. But I listen to these stories from Mark and I can just put them into the models that I was learning in graduate school, school that Paul had written, right? So Mark is wow. telling the story and I'm thinking to myself, I think that was Krugman 1979 in that paper there. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do the math version of all of this afterward if people want to stay online. Back to you, Sabah. Great. I'm sure they're going to want to stay online um, for that for that bonus content. Um, great. Okay. So we've just been talking about uh, subsidies and a, and a shipping congestion charge uh, uh, promoted by Paul. Um, so let's talk more about um, policy. Uh, again, using my privileges as leader to, to zigzag the conversation. Um, it none of you will have failed to notice that we have a change in the US administration. Um, we Brexit has happened, right? So now we have kind of post Brexit, well, Brexit's kind of going on. We're post Trump. Um, I suppose the question about the question for Trump would be, is this, will it, does, sorry, has it had any lasting effects? Do you think that they are going to, to have long term um, effects on the global trading system? Uh, I think we've, we've, already addressed some of this, um, but perhaps uh, you want to talk more about the kind of the politics of this um, also in the context of Brexit. Um, Paul, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, the so uh, part of what I was saying is obviously the United States, you know, we were the, uh, we were the international trade rule obeyer of last resort. We were, uh, we built the system that was pretty much on, in, you know, a U.S., style legalistic system, but we were also the country that would intervene to sustain that system. And we were, we would obey our own, uh, we, we would obey the, the constraints we had set down, even though we had the power to, to ignore them. Um, and that, and that's no longer true. So the U S and even though it's not Trump anymore, we now know that the United States can do that. And I just want to say the, th there's a very peculiar thing, again, something I haven't fully wrapped my mind around. On the one hand, Trump's protectionism did not have really deep roots in public opinion. Uh, the globalization backlash in, in U.S. politics was, I think, much exaggerated. And, we, we, um, and, and by, according to the polls, people ended Trump's four years far more supportive of, of global trade than they had been at the beginning. So it was, um, on the other hand, uh, the Trump tariffs created facts. Um, it's... Uh, I certainly know a little bit from conversation, but also just from the obvious things that um, the Biden administration is not going to roll back all of the measures that were taken against China. Um, partly, even if it doesn't think, even if they privately don't think that they're smart, who wants to set yourself up to be accused of being soft on China? And so there's a lot of ways in which, even though there wasn't a lot of deep political roots behind much of what went on, it's nonetheless has permanently changed the, the scene. And I, I mean, it's, I, you know, I've, if, I don't know if anybody in the Biden administration is thinking, oh, so let's revive TPP. Uh, but if they are, uh, I would tell them, uh, you know, I don't care about the merits. That would just be idiotic. And I think that, that lots of people think that way now. I'm not sure there are many in the Biden administration who are on the brink of uh, yeah. reviving TPP. So I think they share your political instincts. Um, yeah. I, Okay, so um, rather than ask Chad and, and and Mark that question, but maybe you can return to it in, in your next answer. Oh, and sorry, before I before I say that, um, just to alert the um, the audience uh, that in around five minutes we're going to have uh, some Q and A. Um, so if you have a burning question, uh, then do put it in the Q and A, um, and we'll try and get to uh, as many of them as possible. Um, okay, so with our five minutes until that. Um, I want to play a game of, of kind of, I guess there's overrated and underrated. Um, and so each, each of you is going to have to pick a big trade conflict and sort of decide whether it's overrated or underrated, right? Um, so, and you know, I guess which, which are the trade conflicts that are actually going to be much more important than we think, um, even now, and which are the ones that are maybe gonna be a bit less important 
um, than we think. Okay, so I'm going to ask each of you to pick one and choose overrated or underrated and why. And you all have to pick a different one. Those are the rules of the game. I am the one uh, in control here, so I can decide. Um, uh, and Chad, I'm going to be very mean and he looks upset. Yep, we're still going to go with you, Chad. Okay, uh, you're first. Well, that's actually good because that means I get to, to pick which whatever I want. I was worried they were going to, the others were going to take mine. Um, so I'm going to go with vaccines and I'm going to say underrated. Um, so here's why. So, uh, and I apologize. I know everybody's heard way too much about vaccines. Um, and hopefully you're all getting vaccinated and you're getting offered to be vaccinated and, and you're taking it up very, very, very pro vaccine. But my concern is that um, we've spent you know, a number of months trying to figure out vaccines, the economics of vaccines and how vaccines are made. And they're super complicated to make, to manufacture. What that means, there's only a handful of countries in the entire world that are gonna be able to do it. We're lucky here in the United States that we're one of them. Us, Europe, China, India, and you know, a handful of others. But what that means is with the pandemic still raging everywhere, the emergence of variants, um, everybody's gonna, be need, gonna need to be vaccinated and trade is going to have to be the solution. So there's proposals out there, well, let's just waive intellectual property rights and everybody can make a vaccine in their basement. Um, it's just, that's not the way vaccines work. Vaccines are super hard. They need to be regulated as we're seeing. You know, you learn over time, this one doesn't quite work. So we gotta get rid of that one and use this one. Trade has to be the solution to this thing, getting us out of the pandemic. And we are so far away from cooperating uh, on this. We now basically, all the countries that are manufacturing these things have implicit or explicit export restrictions in place, meaning they're not, for the most part, selling them off to the world, sharing them with the world. Uh, and, and this is a, a huge, huge problem, right? And I actually think this is partially a legacy, another one that, that um, Kind of piggybacks on what Paul was saying about the Trump administration. The fact that we're not seeing cooperation on this fundamentally kind of one of the biggest issues of our time, I kind of lay at the feet of, uh, you know, four years of the Trump administration as well. Vaccines. Great. Okay. Briefly, uh, Mark, you're next. Uh, domestic content requirements, uh, I would say, are probably not getting a sufficient attention at this point. Uh, Trump was into this, uh, the Biden people uh, seem to be into it even more. Uh, we're now talking about spending a couple of trillion dollars for infrastructure by somebody's definition. And there have been noises made that all of this money should be spent on uh, domestic products that we shouldn't be importing. This is a, a huge amount of money relative to the US economy. And if we are saying, that none of this money can be spent on imported products, then we're really uh, potentially slapping our trading partners in the face. And it would not be a huge shock if some of them would make a similar move. So I think this has some potential to uh, disrupt trading in a way that uh, simply putting up tariffs doesn't really do. Great, thank you. Uh, and, and Paul? Okay, um, this is an invitation to get myself into trouble. So let me let me say Brexit um, as something that I, is overrated as an issue, even though I thought it was a terrible idea. And um, uh, you know, it, it's uh, uh, but the and I, I basically I think it's interesting because all of my friends, uh, certainly all of my British friends, are very anti-Brexit and and horrified. But there is this tendency to view it, I think, in apocalyptic terms. And it isn't, it's frictions. The adjustment, it's, there's some chaotic stuff that's happening now, but in the end, can you live next to a much larger trading partner, which is by force of the gravity equation, your dominant trading partner without a, with a border and with, with trade barriers. And yeah, there's this country called Canada that does that. And, um, and in the end, um, although, there are all kinds of backwards, but I think the, the, the shock of Brexit is that it happened and it will knock a couple of points off British GDP in, in perpetuity, but, but it's not going to be the end of the world. And it, eventually it'll just become part of the background noise. Okay. Uh, 
we could we could Samaya, hopefully... would you like to respond to that no nope, i'm going to move a, straight straight on uh uh there's a conflict of interest there um yeah. so um mine is um carbon border adjustment tariffs oh. um which i think so far has spent a lot of time in nerdy economics papers where everyone's describing how elegant this wonderful solution would be um but actually it's going to be politically very very difficult um when places like the eu and perhaps even the us um start uh, trying to adjust for the carbon content of products uh, at the border. Um, I think there are a lot of exporting countries who are not going to be very happy um, about that, even though the intentions of politicians will, uh, at least there'll be some noble intentions there. Oh, kidokes. Um, I think it is now time to move on to the Q&A. Thank you so much for everyone's questions. Uh, thank you to Stephen Sanders, who accused us of being late, uh, only two minutes after the official start date. I'd say that was relatively punctual. Um, uh, okay, so our question, um, oh dear, hang on, I've copied the question, but not says, said who, here we go. Uh, the question from Sandy F. Um, is whether China's, Russian and other countries stealing intellectual property and governments backing their national champions a corruption to a rules-based world economy. Um, so, yeah, is IP, IP theft, national backing of national champions, is that somehow incompatible with a rules-based system or does it challenge it? Uh, Chad's Chad's looking uh, slightly shell shocked, but I'm going to ask him anyway, as he's our uh, resident lover of the rules based system. Chad, take it away. No, I was looking at other questions. There's so many good ones here. Um, national champions and rules based system. Yeah, I think I think um, it's hard to square the circle on those. Um, you know, maybe it's worth saying just a, a, two things on, on national champions that, that have been emerging in, you know, the, in the last um, period of time that I think are potential changes, right? And so one is um, this announcement by the Biden administration of a potential um, multilateral solution through their tax plan, um, which would in effect potentially give up some of the national championness of uh, of the Apples and Amazons and, and Googles and Facebooks of the world by allowing under this plan, the rest of the world to share some of the tax revenue that they generate uh, in jurisdictions all over the world. So um, this is an area of potential cooperation that we haven't seen in the past. It was threatening to spill over into trade. Other countries were threatening to impose these things called digital services taxes on these companies. Uh, the United States was going to have to threaten to, to put tariffs on and retaliate. In any case, these are you know arguably America's national champions that we're sharing with the world in in kind of interesting ways. So maybe I just contradicted myself. Great, a true economist. Um, uh, wonderful. Okay, so next question. I want to get through as many as possible, so I'm not going to ask you um, all all to answer the same questions. Um, so the next question is from Min Gao, um, who points out that the national national security um, is increasingly becoming an issue and is being used as a justification to impose trade restrictions. Um, they mentioned silicon chips and maybe crucial medical supplies. How much of this is a threat? to um, global trade. Mark, do you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, I think that's a, a very interesting question. I, I want to uh, talk a little bit more um, broadly about what I see going on in this area because there is a lot of interest in picking up on this theme of resiliency to say we need to make things here in the United States, okay? and. It's not very well understood that taking something that's produced in another country and making it in the United States does not improve resiliency. It does not reduce the vulnerability to some kind of shock that will interrupt production. Uh, it does not give you multiple points of production. It does not give you multiple supply lines. So if what we're really concerned about is ensuring the continuing uh, flow of products, we need to have 
multiple production sites in multiple countries. We need to have multiple routings through multiple ports. We don't solve those problems by saying, we're going to remove this production from China and bring it all here to the United States and put it in Phoenix, Arizona. And I think that that aspect of building a more resilient economy often gets lost in the, the political debate about bringing things back home. Yeah, my take on this question of national security is that it's it's really a challenge, right? So if you think about after the Second World War, um, it was actually American uh, negotiators who were, were trying to limit the use of the national security exception in the global trading rules. Uh, the American negotiators were worried about other governments turning to national security uh, as an excuse to apply trade restrictions that were really in the name of, of uh, encouraging their domestic uh, economies. Um, and so what we've seen now um, with this shift away, um, normalizing, the normalizing of national security security um, as a justification for trade restrictions. Um, I happen to think that there are some genuine, legitimate national security concerns in some cases. Um, in the case of aluminium from Canada, as Paul mentioned earlier, I'm much, much less certain. Uh, and so I see that as a, as a kind of potential um, a sort of spillover side effect um, and, a, and a worrying area if, if what you're worried about is, is greater um, trade restrictions uh, that have been essentially mislabeled. Um, okay, my next question is for Paul. Um, so we have a question from Ivan Garay, um, which is what kind of globalization could raise wages of America's and Americans and create more jobs? What is a yeah. jobs producing globalization? Okay, so actually, I, I think it's, it's, it's more of a wage question than a jobs question, although we all use that as shorthand. It's, it's what will raise the demand for labor and, um, and my take on this is in general that we overstate that a lot of people um, it, it's not it is the case that that increased imports of labor intensive products have probably has contributed to rising inequality in the United States, but it's probably not that big a deal. And it's not clear how much you can do. I mean, the, the ability to um, uh, that that some reshaping of globalization is going to make any significant difference. But I think the point, so the, the real thing, it partly is to just disabuse ourselves of that and understand that it's a different world, that the, um, uh, not, not a globalization world, but in, in that sense that um, the, the <sighs> manufacturing is a, is a greatly reduced share of employment from what it used to be. It used to be a third of the workforce, and now it's uh, it's I don't I haven't looked at the latest numbers, but we're in the order of ten percent now. Uh, that's not primarily because of the trade deficit or anything like that. You know, if we shut everything off, we'd still only get a couple of points back. It's mostly because of changing patterns of spending and technological progress and all that. Um, so, there, if you really want to talk about wages and jobs, you want to be talking about taking the service sector and making it a better place to work. Um, and what's interesting is even things that we associate with globalization actually produce a lot of service jobs that are not tradable. So this whole, you know, Amazon unionization thing, uh, I don't know what fraction of the stuff you can buy on Amazon is, is tradable, but probably the great bulk of it. Um, but the actual business model, the thing that is that there are all these warehouses with hundreds of thousands of workers close to major markets, and everything really is about what kind of bargaining power those workers have, what wages they have. So I, I think we, one of the things we probably need to do is that this was a kind of a Trumpian answer. The, the reason that we don't, you don't have good jobs anymore is because of globalization and those globalists. And it's actually, it's not. It's because of the, the shift in the bargaining power of capital versus labor in the domestic economy. And uh, so in a way that the, the right kind of, the, the globalization change that would help wages is understanding that it's not actually about globalization. Okie dokes. Um, thank you. Okay, our next question is from Robert Wolf, and I'm going to direct this at Chad. Um, and it is, what is the most important policy action to reduce current levels of uncertainty? Um, so I think, I'm not sure this is the, the most important one, but I think one of the ones that I'm most worried about is at the moment, we don't have 
any agreed upon way to resolve disputes, trade disputes between countries, right? So even if you're, you're thinking about, um, if anybody wants to bring a dispute against the United States, good luck, right? The WTO system doesn't really work. The Trump administration sort of blocked the old way of doing it. Um, if you kind of do something wrong, you don't know how the United States is going to respond. Are they going to file one of these Section 301 cases again? The Biden administration really hasn't explained what, what it is that they're going to do in terms of their approach. This the system doesn't work for, you know, it's not just the United States killed it with respect to any disputes with respect to America, but it really killed it off for any, you know, second, third, fourth countries out there in the world. So I think that's a really, really big concern. Now, the even the existing rules that we have out there. We're not really sure how they're going to be enforced and when frictions come up, how they're going to be resolved. And I think that is probably a bigger source of uncertainty than we're currently giving credit to. Thank you. Um, one thing in this in this sort of discussion about um, globalization that we've been having so far, we haven't really talked about movement of people. Um, I guess we've talked about movement of my cats, um, but not so much movement of my people. Um, and not not everyone considers my cats um, people. Um, so I suppose there's a, there's a kind of uh, maybe a question for Paul. Like, what what role do you sort of see movement of people having in this in this wider globalization debate? I'm trying to a few a few questions. One one person has said has asked to talk about economic forced migration. Um, another one has asked about the views on the economic impacts of low skilled immigration um, from the C Central American Northern Triangle countries. Um, how should we think about that, Paul? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that I think, I mean, historically, globalization, the first great wave of globalization in the late 19th, early 20th century, really was also massive movements of people. And it was pretty important. And, um, and I mean, there's so many dimensions to this, but just one thing, I don't think, despite all of the Zoom calling that we're doing and all of that, that we have yet established that, that we can do without a lot of personal contact as a way to make this work. In the end, you know, wearing a GoPro, having some guy wear a GoPro, that's that's brilliant. Uh, but still, I think there's still nothing quite the same as actually being able to have uh, the the operations manager visit that factory in Guangzhou and and see what they're doing. And um, so uh, I I suspect that if we really are going to be a world with greatly reduced movement of people, it is going to really have a lot of, it, it, it's gradual, it doesn't, you can keep the supply chains going for a, a while, but developing new ones, um, repairing th when things go wrong. And, and I think that, that, that we really do need that the, the ability of people to move around a lot is something that matters more than you can easily pin down. I don't know that for sure. And, um, and I'm kind of hoping personally, uh, I've been quite enjoying being able to give speeches around the world without actually having to go anyplace. But, but I suspect that in the end, people will want to have face-to-face -face meetings with people again. I know I certainly do. Um, and I hope that the next time that we uh, manage to convene for an event like this, we are able to do it in person. Um, but for this evening, uh, I think all I now have to say is a huge thank you uh, to our hosts. Thank you to Chad, thank you to Mark, and thank you to Paul. Uh, and I think that is all for us. And, and the really keen can stay for the extra half hour of algebra chat. Um, right. But I personally um, will be saying good night. So goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.